Great. So, uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Today is the fourth in our uh, series of priority themes uh, to strengthen accountability for water. Um, we've covered so far gender, the role of donors, and making governments listen. And today's session on measuring accountability will be followed by a final session on closing civic space in two weeks' time. Um, so the foundation uh, for this webinar series is our global evidence review into accountability and advocacy in the water sector. So this has been a comprehensive um, two-year review looking into a wider range of literature, trying to identify what the evidence says about what works, where and why when it comes to uh, accountability and advocacy interventions. Um, and the foundation for these webinars is part three of the Global Evidence Review, which focuses on priority themes for water. Uh, what we try to do is organize the evidence uh, around emerging insights according to three different clusters. Uh, first of all, community dynamics. Secondly, the enabling environment, uh, which informs accountability uh, outcomes. And thirdly, the governance dynamics, which can subdue or stimulate uh, accountability within the water sector. And through this, we developed a theory of change, which tries to kind of conceptualize the process of accountability that I'll touch on in a moment. Um, and the evidence summaries and analysis that we performed, we hope can help identify um, knowledge gaps within the sector and help guide future research priorities so that we can uh, strengthen accountable water governance and uh, wash service delivery. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, the full uh, um, theory of change that we developed, you can view on our website, accountabilityforwater.org, and you can also access the full reports there. So I'm only gonna cover some of the key findings today. Um, and in terms of the conceptual framework we've been using, I just wanted to introduce what we've dubbed the accountability cycle to try and theorize uh, the process through which accountability occurs. Um, and as you can see, there's five stages to this uh, for um, accountable water governance to be realized. Um, we've identified five um, elements that you need. First of all, clear rules, norms and standards which are in place and appropriate between uh, and clearly understood between rights holders and duty bearers. Secondly, uh, clear responsibilities where obligations and duties are clearly assigned and understood. Thirdly, uh, appropriate reporting and monitoring mechanisms, which are available and widely used. Fourthly, a uh, clear process of review and explanation for performance. And fifthly, uh, reaction via corrective measures and sanctions, which are in place and effective. And when we're talking about uh, accountability mechanisms, these can range from social accountability mechanisms such as citizen report cards or interventions to strengthen citizen voice to budgetary accountability mechanisms such as participatory budget tracking. Uh, can you go back to the previous slide, please? Uh, yeah, budget tracking and um, monitoring that can also cover um, evidence-based advocacy, including media campaigns and um, freedom of information campaigns. Uh, and it can also include statutory accountability mechanisms such as customer service charters, public interest litigation and ombudsman services. Next slide, please. And within the report, we've got five sections according to these five priority themes we've identified. Um, so I'm just gonna highlight some of the um, key findings from uh, the section on measuring accountability. And yeah, as I mentioned, each chapter starts with this visual dashboard to highlight where the evidence is coming from. So you can see here, um, out of our total sample of 151 papers, um, we found 48 journal articles which discussed uh, evidence relevant to how approaches to measuring accountability. And this was the bulk of the evidence uh, relevant to this theme but to a lesser extent, organizational reports from um, NGOs and civil society organizations were also relevant and had some useful insights. Um, in terms of the interventions covered, uh, the majority focused on uh, mechanisms that aimed to strengthen citizen voice when it came to water governance. 
uh, and as you can see, research analysis was also important, perhaps reflecting um, the need for monitoring evaluation when it comes to uh, program interventions within the water sector. Uh, and dialogue, pro debate and dialogue processes were also featured within the evidence that we looked at as well. Uh, as you can see in the map on the right hand side, in terms of the geographical scope, the evidence was uneven. Uh, most evidence was clustered in India and in East Africa, specifically uh, Kenya, Uganda and Tanzania. Uh, we did also have um, some evidence coming from uh, North America as well. But um, there's clearly some evidence gaps there when it comes to the geographical spread of evidence about how to measure accountability and ensure that uh, monitoring is in place. Um, in terms of the sectors covered, again, you can see uh, in the uh, graph on the bottom right hand side that the majority of evidence was focusing on water, sanitation and hygiene. So focusing primarily on service delivery uh, and the installation of infrastructure, which arguably is easier to measure than agricultural water management or water resource management, which received much less attention within the literature. And I'm now going to come on to some of the um, key insights that we've discovered through evaluating the evidence. These are going to be the headline findings only because we don't have time to go into everything in detail. So as I said, I would recommend reading um, the relevant chapters in the report if you're interested in learning more. I'm just going to flag some of the more uh, relevant, interesting insights that we discovered. Um, and there's a couple of uh, key references on each side, slide to refer to if you're interested in finding out more. So the first one relating to uh, the community dynamics, which uh, are relevant to measuring accountability. Um, first of all, um, better tools are needed to resolve the differing perceptions of what success looks like. Um, and what we found was that communities, donors and implementing uh, agents, whether that was governments or NGO, uh, or had different views of uh, what was important when they were trying to evaluate and measure the relative success of uh, accountability interventions. So um, there, were, there was a challenge in reconciling differing metrics of success uh, between donors, communities, and these implementing agents. And this lack of clarity or consensus could, over definitions of good practice um, or what seem to be good behavioral norms, could undermine trust within and between communities. And there was an example from Costa Rica uh, where Ballesteros et al identified the differing priorities of donors and local actors as a source of potential tension. Um, in this example, uh, where there was um, uh, water projects funded by external donors to um, improve water services at a community level, um, and in contrast to the local preference for more open-ended experimental and uh, subjective processes, um, the donors tended to request fairly discrete, measurable, quantitative outcomes um, in terms of evaluating how the project had performed. And in this context, local organizations felt constrained by a sense of inferiority, disempowerment, and a lack of legitimacy because they lacked the ability to uh, speak in numbers or using numerical terms um, and present these quantitative outputs. And unfortunately, the simplified vision uh, of politicians and aid workers failed to capture complexities and local nuances on the ground. And these uh, disagreements that occurred led to efforts by local actors to bypass donor requirements, subverting monitoring and reporting logics. Um, so this highlights how um, yeah, differing views within communities can uh, impact the um, pre-designed measurement approaches, which might not be appropriate within certain local contexts. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, and the second point I wanted to mention around community dynamics was that uh, there can be significant challenges when it comes to measuring interventions because robust measurement of accountability uh, is often constrained by limited or unreliable data at a community level. And a paper by Flores et al. from 2013 highlighted how 
um, there was often uh, reluctance from certain households in poor rural areas to disclose relevant information um, because there was cultural stigma, uh, cultural taboos, or even a threat of violence um, when it came to uh, reporting poor governance, especially relating to uh, corruption within uh, the local state. And um, yeah, so this lack of reliable data and the lack of availability of data hindered efforts to uh, measure how uh, different accountability interventions and governance processes were uh, being performed. In terms of the enabling environment, um, there's a couple of key findings I'm going to bring up. Uh, first of all, a uh, paper from Fogelberg in 2013, uh, which uh, draws on field reflections from the NGO uh, Water for People, and they highlighted how there was a need for methodologies which brought together different discipline, dis disciplinary approaches, so from both social sciences, uh, as well as kind of engineering and more quantitative approaches, uh, which could help to remedy problems around measurement um, and inconsistencies within data, bringing about better results. Uh, and they focused on the need for a realistic timescale for monitoring assessment, which often extended for a longer period than a lot of uh, local NGO assessments were doing um, prior to that intervention. Um, so uh, in this paper, they proposed expanding from a singular focus on measuring access to water and sanitation infrastructure, what they dubbed pipes and pumps, to consider wash service, delivery and sustainability data, assessing the quality and durability of water services over longer time frames. Next slide, please. Um, another key finding relating to the enabling environment was that the broader cultural and historical context was quite important when it came to measuring success of different interventions uh, and when data was um, extracted and separated from this it could provide an incomplete or misleading picture so there was a need for well-resourced evaluations to improve uh, measuring capabilities and this required uh, appropriate tools to evaluate and diagnose different interventions um, so again, um, going back to the Nicaraguan example, uh, what was applied here was an indicative framework to uh, measure and assess um, water outcomes relating to uh, availability, um, access, uh, equity and water quality, which was rooted in human rights based approaches. And this methodology aimed to strengthen accountability through alignment with international covenants and legal principles, which gave a certain coherence um, to efforts to measure uh, how different water um, projects and interventions uh, were performing. And drawing on survey data and structured interviews with rural households and water committees, the study devised a composite measure uh, which incorporated uh, yeah, the presence of, um, yeah, which incorporated availability, accessibility, affordability, and quality of water services, as well as um, participation and access to information for local uh, community members as well, and also non-discrimination, looking at uh, racial justice as well. Um, and the authors here argued that water sector monitoring indicators need to be uh, both easily accessible at the local level, um, accurately defined, standardized, and internationally applicable, scalable, and periodically updatable, um, so that they could be revised um, in response to yeah, changing understandings and norms in terms of uh, accountability within the sector. Um, but ultimately, this combination of indicators and data sources was able to better capture the complex relationships between rights holders and duty bearers within the region. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, I'm now going to move on to the governance dynamics, which could subdue or stimulate accountability. And the first uh, point I wanted to raise was how uh, mixed performance indicators uh, as combined with analysis over long time scales and uh, 
the prioritization of local knowledge uh, was important in reflecting the different impacts of accountability tools and processes uh, which influenced water out access, quality, equity, uh, availability, etc. Um, and there's an example I wanted to bring up from Ethiopia, um, where Dunstan and Gilletta uh, provided a uh, assessment review of the Millennium Water Alliance project. Um, and as external assessors, they deem this project a, project a success. So according to a baseline survey, they found that project partners have increased access to safe water sources for over 500,000 rural Ethiopians over nine years. So as you can see, this is a much longer time frame than a lot of um, NGO projects and programs. Um, the monitoring strategy that they applied enabled project partners to identify uh, gaps in knowledge to solicit remedies and to prepare, prepare mitigation plans uh, in consultation with user community uh, representatives. And what they found was that regular audit and review processes were really important to uh, strengthening the success of accountable WASH sector programs. Uh, another important factor was the internal dynamics of different program activities. And this really highlighted the value of a collaborative approach between um, different stakeholders who were involved in projects, whether that was um, water users, local government, or uh, implementing agencies. Um, because initially what they found was that a lack of a unified approach uh, where there had been separate monitoring programs by different partners had limited the generation of reliable evidence base and obstructed data collection. Uh, however, ultimately project partners decided on common indicators and a common monitoring framework and where these minimum standards and indicators um, provided a much better framework for measuring accountability, allowing uh, their work to be evaluated across diverse contexts and settings. And finally, um, another key finding from the governance dynamics was the need for uh, open data sharing between governments government and also at different levels of government from uh, local municipal governments up to the national level. And this was important in improving measurement uh, of different program interventions. Uh, and also it was important in encouraging a commitment to joint and participatory information production. And here I'm just gonna bring up an example from uh, Hunchins et al, which was a comparative multi-study, multi, -study, multi country analysis of eight different watersheds across Europe, Africa, and Asia. In the picture, you can actually see the Amudaria River Basin in Central Asia, which stretches across Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan. And um, basically what this comparative analysis found was that um, top-down command and control governance regimes tended to deliver much worse water resource management outcomes than uh, river basins where there was more uh, flexible, responsive and participatory methods applied. Uh, so regional water boards and management authorities who developed a commitment to joint or participatory information production uh, perform much better than their counterparts when dealing with floods, droughts and other hazards. And what this showed was a lack of consensual knowledge could obstruct cooperation, especially when it was trying to deal with uh, when authorities were trying to deal with uncertainty and change. So there was a need to open up space for policy learning through much more collaborative uh, information sharing practices. Uh, and this could secure greater preparedness against these growing complexities, uh, conflicts and future uncertainties, for example, uh, uncertainties around climate change and how this might influence uh, water use in the future. So water governance outcomes were positively linked to broad communication between stakeholders, uh, open and shared information sources, and an openness to experimentation through an iterative process, which was described as double loop learning. And when it comes to measurement uh, of accountability, yeah, I think this uh, iterative process of learning and reflection was really significant in this example. Uh, and a final point they raised was that pooling resources and ensuring consistency of approach based around agreed principles and protocols was also important for 
collating and collecting more accurate uh, data to measure and assess. Next slide, please. So I'm now going to highlight some of the key knowledge gaps and priorities for future research that we think would be um, apt when it comes to understanding how best to measure accountability. Um, and yeah, some of these themes have been discussed in the literature, but um, not necessarily in detail or not in all geographical regions. And uh, as I showed at the beginning, very much uh, overlooked was uh, agricultural water management and water resource management more broadly. So issues around uh, pollution in rivers, for example, uh, was not really discussed, even though I think there's a lot to say about measurement there. Um, but a key concern, first of all, was about organizing data and, you know, um, synthesizing it um, into a form which is useful for uh, analysts. So there was questions around how best to collate and systematize different uh, anecdotal reports or informal uh, points raised around accountability failures and how to ensure that there was a robust process for uh, analyzing this. Um, and collecting uh, data according to consistent protocols. Uh, in a related sense, uh, there was a need for much more robust assessment of uh, accountability data, especially thinking about how to track different accountability relationships between rights holding citizens, uh, government duty bearers, uh, and also private utilities who might also be providing uh, service provision. Um, and again, there was this need to think about what common benchmarks and indicators can be applied so that we can compare um, accountability interventions across different contexts. Um, and also thinking about assessment practices, there was a need for more participatory monitoring um, and long-term analysis. And uh, going back to this point around participatory monitoring, and bringing in community voices, there was a need to think about how to recognize and bring in um, more subjective appraisals of what uh, constituted success within the water sector. Um, so that recognizing that there were diverse views within water users uh, relating to trust, transparency, and political responsiveness, and also recognizing that this is very much informed by values, including cultural values, uh, norms, and uh, behaviors and thinking around, for example, uh, the differing approaches of indigenous communities to uh, and customary water management practices versus uh, more technocratic modern approaches and how to reconcile uh, these different approaches to uh, measuring uh, water governance practices and the successful failures um, coming from those. So that's all I wanted to uh, bring up now for now. I'm now going to hand over to um, our invited speakers.